Australia and Asia. The chair of this session is Professor John Simons, Executive Dean of Arts at Macquarie University and also a CHAS board member. John is the Executive Dean of Arts at Macquarie and he's previously worked at universities in Wales, Exeter, Winchester, Edge Hill and Lincoln in the UK before he decided it was a good idea to come here and has also held several professorships in the United States, a world traveller as such. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, the Higher Education Academy, the Zoological Society of London and the Oxford Centre for Animal Ethics. I feel myself going into a more English accent the longer I continue. He has published very widely on topics ranging from Middle English chiv uh, chivalric romance to Andy Warhol and from codicology to the history of cricket. I now hand over to the learned Professor John Simons. Thank you, Jules. Um, we have a slight uh, change of panel today. I'll just introduce our panel first from what you have in your program. We have Professor Krishna Sen, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences of the uh, University of Western Australia. Uh, next to me, um, Professor Jacqueline Lowe, uh, Professor and Director of the ANU Centre for European Studies in the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, Kathy Kirby, the Executive Director of the Asia Education Foundation. Then we have next to Kathy Peter Leahy, uh, the prof professor and the director of the National Security Institute at, uh, in Canberra and the University of Canberra. And finally, uh, Monica Attard, uh, a journalist of some repute. This uh, session is an important session. Um, we're going to run it slightly differently. The, the, the panelists will give their, um, make their presentations and then we're going to throw it straight open to the floor. Um, I guess the Asian century is one of those things which uh, is going to be at the centre of national debate uh, over the next decade. Uh, as geopolitics shifts, uh, Australia has to find a place within that shifting world order. I do a lot of work on India. One of the things that I say in uh, many, of the uh, many of the talks I give on India to various groups is that it seems to me at any rate, and I may be wrong, that uh, while the future of Australia uh, is heavily dependent on the relationship that we manage to make with India, uh, the future of India is probably not that heavily dependent on the relationships that it makes with Australia. Uh, not everyone likes to hear that message, but I think it's very true, and I think it will become more true, and we have to sort that out. Um, those of you that have seen The Australian today will have seen a, uh, uh, a little article about the um, discontinuation or not discontinuation of the teaching of Indonesian at a university in Sydney. And last week, uh, Julie Bishop uh, made some public statements about uh, the commitment of a future coalition government, if such emerges, uh, to further development of the teaching of Asian languages. Uh, these are very important straws in the wind, I think. Let's, let's hope uh, that they're backed up uh, with some real political will and uh, the ability given to those who are going to deliver those things to make them happen. I won't carry on. We're going to straight now to Krishna. Um, Krishna? Yeah. Thanks very much, um, John. Um, I was, uh, like John, thinking back on the comments that uh, Julie Bishop made at the Deans of Arts and Social Sciences and Humanities Conference only two weeks ago about the importance of the Asian century and um, what uh, commitments the, uh, the coalition government was going to make to the study of Asian languages um, and, um, and, um, uh, and study abroad in Asia. And then I heard George uh, Brandis this morning. Um, and uh, the contrast was extraordinary because of the extent to which uh, Senator Brandis's comments were so completely locked in a, um, what he himself, I think, would be quite happy to describe as a classical Anglophone Eurocentric 
world, where is our past, it's in Europe's traditions, this was his answer. And, and this actually uh, is quite interesting, and I'll come back to this in a slightly different way, but, um, uh, but because the, the, the topic is not just uh, the Asian century, but there is an encouragement in the theme of this conference to start with the human dimension. I want to start back on a, on a personal <coughs> journey, as, as it were. As you can probably tell, I'm an Australian of um, Asian extraction. Uh, when I first arrived in Australia in the late 70s, there was an enormous excitement, enormous excitement about looking forward into a non-Eurocentric, non-Anglophone world because it was the late 70s and it was the beginnings of SBS, multicultural, multilingual radio and television. Now what underlay that discourse, and I'm so glad other people this morning have used the term discourse repeatedly so I don't feel like some cultural studies nerd, um, even ministers are using the term discourse these days, um, so uh, there was this enormous excitement about this discourse, and that, that discourse, I think, had a completely non-instrumentalist basis in the sense that it, had, um, it, it was not about economic development. It was not about political survival. It was about hope. It was a, about an inclusive, or what I think Walid Ali would have called an inclusive nationalism. It was about us in a complex world trying to remake ourselves. And to my mind, the Asia century discussion in Australia has completely missed that point. The Asia century discussion of Austra uh, in Australia has defined Asia as out there, somehow necessary for our economic survival and the Asia century discussion has further underlined uh, the us, them, exclusionary, exclusionary nature of Australian nationalism and the concentration on we must learn Asian languages. And I have to confess at this point, I'm part of the language lobby, no question about it. I think we should be learning as many languages as possible. But that discussion has further underlined us as an Anglophone community. We speak English, we live in Australia, Asia is out there. The elephant in the room in that discussion is if we don't somehow manage to deal with Asia, gosh, we are in big trouble. So the discussion of, just as multiculturalism discussion had an excitement about it, had an attraction about it, had an ethical, moral dimension to it, I think the Asia uh, century discourse has completely eschewed that. Um, a, a, a friend of a number of uh, people on this panel, Tim Lindsay, said in, a, uh, in, a, in a one such panel once, we can't expect um, the whole world to talk back to us in broken English. Um, that's not what is the end of the story nor should we expect the whole world to talk back to us in broken English because the universality of English is a particular consequence of a particular colonial history. And we know that other languages have risen and died as international languages before, e.g. Latin, e.g. French. And English too will have that history, but that's not the essence of what the Asia century should be. To my mind, Asia century, and, I, I, and in that context, may I say, I have increasingly become uncomfortable with the catch-all term that we're calling Asia literacy, learning about Asia, because Asia literacy further entrenches the notion of Asia as an ethnographic object out there somewhere which, about which we need to <coughs> develop some kind of um, knowledge base, some kind of, do I have two more minutes? Two more minutes, okay. Um, some kind of knowledge base. I better move very quickly on this. Um, I would rather see us looking forward 
to developing communication for an Asian century, because it's not learning about them out there, it's, le it's learning together in what Walid Ali just wonderfully, in a wonderful turn of phrase, called the hyper-complex world. So in that hyper-complex world, in a, in a, in a time of hyper-differentiation, in a time where you can be simultaneously global and parochial, in a time where, can, where you can be in an Indonesian village working to the instructions on the internet of a global network which is ultimately highly limited, highly parochial. In that context, we need to communicate in different ways. So I would think about this as learning communication strategies or teaching communication strategies <coughs> for a complex world for an Asian century. The facts and figures and the statistics of the Asian century are well known. <coughs> Andre Gunder Frank declared the coming of the Asian millennium as early as the 1990s. So there is nothing new in the data, but we do need to understand the Asian century in a completely different way. And if we're going to be focused on um, communication, then we must be focused on the issue of languages. And the issue of languages is both an issue of right, the right of the people to learn a diverse range of languages, and the responsibility to not expect, and, and the responsibility to change the power balance of the world which speaks in English in every sense. You know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask in the last panel, I didn't get a chance, and I'm going to leave it there because I see some of the members are still sitting here and they might answer when we open this up to the floor. And that is, we rarely talk about power in relation to um, either internal or global politics these days. The rise of Asia has, or the discourse of the rise of Asia, not the realities of Asia, the discourse of the rise of Asia has somehow allowed us to forget about the fundamental inequalities, inequalities embedded in la linguistic and cultural relations. Um, so I would, uh, I'm going to stop there because I think I've run out of my seven minutes, but we can come back to that. Thank you very much, Krishna. And I'd like to uh, invite Cathy to speak. Thanks very much, John, and it's a pleasure to be here. So I want to talk about the Asian century through the prism of a five-year-old child, a five-year-old child uh, starting school in Australia today. We'll enter their working lives just at the time when China and India resume their positions as the world's global economic powers. So a key question for us in Australia is, is our school education equipping those five-year-olds for their future? Because those kids are going to need foundational and deep knowledge to be able to communicate with the region, to understand and respond to its cultural diversity, to be able to resolve global issues with our neighbours, to be able to have a prosperous future. All of these sorts of skills and knowledge and understandings are going to be required by our five-year-olds if they're going to thrive and prosper in this century. And the most effective channel to achieve an Australian society that has foundational and deep knowledge of the histories, geographies, cultures and languages of the Asian region is through school education that school education has a pivotal role in achieving a universal Asia literacy, a shorthand term for that knowledge and understanding and those skills. Now, those of you who read the submissions um, to the Australia in the Asian Century white paper uh, will have noted that 50% of the 270 submissions talked about the need for Asia capabilities for Australians to have Asia capabilities. So what I want to do in my seven minutes today is just give you a sense of where we are at in Australian school education on progressing or achieving this. And I want to start with the good news. We've never been in a better position in a policy sense to progress 
the knowledge and understanding of the diverse countries of Asia in our school education. We've never been in a better position. All ministers of education agree every 10 years to national goals of schooling. They last did that in 2008 and the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australians calls for the need for Asia literacy for all Australians. Now that led into the new Australian curriculum, our new national curriculum. We've never had a national curriculum before in Australia. It was, began to be implemented this year. There are three cross-curriculum priorities in that Australian curriculum, and one of them is Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia. And that means that all children, from five-year-olds to 18-year-olds in every subject, will be learning and building their knowledge about the countries of their region. We also, the Australian curriculum nominates seven essential capabilities for all children to have by the time they leave school. And one of those, central, one of those seven essential capabilities, along with literacy and numeracy, information, communication, technologies, ethical thinking, one of those is intercultural understanding. We've built the need for teachers and school leaders to, be, to have knowledge and understanding about Asia into our new national professional standards for teachers and school leaders. So there's three major policy levers there that we've never had in place before, and they're positioning us very well. Secondly, why is it a good time? We've never had the sort of state education stakeholder support that we have now. The Education Alliance was set up for Asia Literacy, was set up in 2008 with all of the peak school education bodies agreeing on the need to progress this issue. The Business Alliance for Asia Literacy was established in 2010 where all peak business bodies came together and called on school education to ensure that Asia capabilities were being integrated into Australian school education. And just two weeks ago, this report, Developing an Asia-Capable Workforce, uh, was launched by Mike Smith, the CEO of ANZ, and Ken Henry, chairing the task force, calling on schools, on universities and TAFE to ensure that Asia capabilities would result from education in Australia, and also calling on business to invest themselves in building an Asia-Capable Workforce. So that's the good news. And also, we've had a lot of programs over the last 20 years in our schools that we can build on. But here's the not so good news. We've got the policy in place, but we haven't really invested in implementing that policy. We've only had small scale progress in ensuring that all of our young people are going to have the opportunity to be Asia capable. Student participation in Asian languages currently stands at 18% of Australian school children from year 1 to 12 are studying an Asian language. But in year 12, that figure decreases to 5.8%. And the graph has been going down over the last decade. And some of you will be aware of some of the shocking, quite shocking statistics uh, on this topic. The fact that Indonesian is a language in crisis, declining by 10,000 students a year for the last five years. If that trend continues, there'll be no child doing Indonesian in year 12 in five years' time in Australia. And the fact that we know that 94% of children studying Mandarin Chinese are of Chinese heritage. And that leads to the startling statistic that around 300 children across Australia are learning Chinese who are not of Chinese heritage. That's across Australia today. And just at the time when you would expect young people to be learning about the Asian region in year 12, uh, the Australian Council for Educational Research did a study that showed that only a tiny minority of students were actually learning anything about the Asian region in history, geography, economics, politics and visual arts. An example of that, Year 12 uh, Modern History in New South Wales, students were asked to choose a country for an in-depth study. 2% chose China. 
65% chose Germany and 19% chose Russia. They're quite staggering statistics. The current intermittent and gradual trajectory of improvement is simply not good enough to equip our young people for their future. Why has this progress been so slow? There's a view that past efforts have resulted in nothing. I don't agree with that. I think that there's been critical fault lines in some government strategies. But I think that the key reason why progress has been so slow is that it has been intermittent. It hasn't been sustained. It's changed when governments have changed. We've built up momentum and then we drop momentum. We start a program and then we finish it. We're never going to achieve an Asia Literate Australian school curriculum if we continue on in that vein. We've focused too much on supply and not enough about building demand in the community, demand in students to learn Asian languages amongst their parents and amongst the community. We've mainly focused on Asian languages, that tiny cohort of students undertaking Asian languages, and we've hardly invested at all in the studies of Asia across the curriculum. So what do we need now? My final comment, John. We need a bipartisan, long-term, invested national action plan if we're going to equip those five-year-olds for their future. We need to work nationally and collaboratively. And that means collecting regularly national data. That hardly happens still. We need to develop digital resource banks of curriculum materials. We need to work together on new and innovative ways to teach languages. We need to build up the Asia capability of Australia's education workforce. We need to bring every school principal on board. We need to invest in the knowledge base of our teachers. Why did those kids, why did 65% of those children choose Germany in history and 19% Russia? It wasn't because of student interest. It was because of the knowledge base of their teachers. We need to increase students, parents and the community's understanding of Australia's place in the world and in the region and the importance of having knowledge and skills and understandings about the region in which we live. Now, we've put forward to the Henry Review Australia's Asia Literacy Action Plan and we costed it. We looked at what had worked in the past. So in the mid-90s, for eight years, we invested in the National Asian Languages and Studies in Australian Schools Program, or NALSIS, about 100 million a year. So we estimate that what we need to achieve is going to take 10 years, and that's going to be an investment of somewhere near a billion dollars. So I'll leave you with this thought. The investment of a billion dollars is an investment of $33 per student per year for 10 years. Surely that would be a small price to pay for Australians, for those five-year-olds, to thrive and prosper in the Asian century. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. I hope... Yeah, round of applause, yeah. Uh, I hope that uh, that message gets over, and I think the fact you've actually costed it should uh, should greatly <laughs> help. They'll probably, uh, they'll probably say 32 would be better, but <laughs> okay. Um, I now like to invite uh, Jacqueline. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, I absolutely concur with 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 um, Christian's um, point that we've really approached the you know, the whole conceptualising of the Asian century in in highly problematic instrumentalist ways. Um, this time last year, the Prime Minister commissioned the, the Henry Report, and, and she said that you know this would be a national blueprint for a time of national change um, with rising Asia. The Prime Minister said, Australia has not been here before. 
And this assertion uh, really was a kind of a groundhog day for so many of us who've been um, studying and, and thinking about um, um, the relationship between Asia and Australia. The Asian century has both been anticipated and dreaded from as early as the 1880s and contributed to the development of the so-called White Australia policy that continues to haunt Australia's profile in the region. Those discourses of engagement with the rising Asia and its corollary, the fear of Asian invasion, have played a critical role in the national imaginary. The Ken Henry paper is not the first of its kind. Um, the Asian turn in Australia's policy framework occurred in the late 1980s and early 90s, uh, very much associated with the government of Paul Keating, for example, um, and his enmeshment uh, a push. And uh, the Keating years of, of that time have become the yardstick, I think, for the promotion of Asian literacy and engagement with some very effective changes introduced not only in foreign policy, but also in terms of domestic education. And, you know, Cathy's, um, the AEF has been very much a product uh, of, of that. Um, and I do agree, Cathy, that I think it is the successive governments and the lack of continuity and, and the sustaining of momentum that has caused this Groundhog Day phenomenon. Um, so we have then the succeeding Howard government, which went on to, to develop relatively successful diplomatic and trading relations with Asian uh, countries, but it did not pursue Asia literacy to the same degree. Indeed, how it was of the belief that it was possible to have good relations with Asia without having to engage with it in ways that influenced or changed Australia's domestic, domestic culture, however it was conceived. Well, there's some, there's some anticipation of a revival of um, the so-called um, Asianization of Australia with the election of Rudd in 2007. His term was, of course, too brief uh, to make any impact. And Gillard's government has been very slow, I think, to develop a regional policy. And so there will be much, much close scrutiny on what um, the Henry paper is going to reveal, we hope, very soon, and whether it will achieve what the Prime Minister wishes to maintain an ally in Washington and respect in Beijing. Now, what I find really problematic is how quickly the discourse of Asia and Asian, the Asian century slips into becoming a code for the China century and rising China. They're almost interchangeable in so many aspects of um, the public domain. And um, I don't have time to c cover too much, but I do think it's really interesting the ways in which this uh, uh, our pitching of where Australia sits in security terms and in economic terms between the US and China. Whether we take the Hugh White line, which says that the, that the US will have to play a different kind of a role, it will have to pull back in terms of its uh, domination, its, its, its role uh, uh, as a dominating force in the region and, and in order to manage China. Or you take, say, the Andrew, Andrew Shearer role, um, advisor to, to Howard, who says, well, in fact, our, our main ally remains the US, and in fact, um, points to the ways in which so many other countries in the Asian region have been consolidating and building their relationships with US in the face of a rising China as well. So in that context, Shira would say, we are wise to keep um, our alliance, our, our, our security alliance with the US, while not making an enemy of China. Um, others still say, well, we're in a sweet spot, you know, being able to leverage off both the investment, the US is still our major investment, after all, um, investor in, in, in Australia, um, while leveraging off the, the resource boom to China. However you conceive and make up your mind about how we play this, the question I, I then want to ask us here is, um, what does this mean then for Australia in the Asian century, and more specifically, what does it mean for Australians of Asian descent in this Asian, so-called Asian century? For many of us here, I think, there is some anxiety about this quick slippage between Asianness and Chineseness, um, not, and not just from people of non-Asian, uh, non non-white descent, but also, I would include myself, of people from a variant of 
Chinese descent. There is a concern about this wash of re that is emerging. Um, the promotion of Asia literacy, I think I find uh, uh, problematic in this context then of assuming that there are these superpowers of, of China and then eventually India. In many uh, uh, fora, recent fora, uh, regarding the Asian century and rising China century, there's been an es explicit call to mobilize the um, Asian Australian constituency as valuable human capital, as the economic bridge builders, again, that very instrumentalist ways, without considering the ways in which social cultural capital should also come into the fray. And that, I think, is because the whole Asian discourse, Asian literacy, uh, century discourse has been so instrumentally targeted at trade and economics. And I don't mean to represent the um, Asian and Australian constituency as being passive either. There have been many, many community leaders and politicians of Asian descent in Australia who play into and buy into this very limited role for the Asian and Australian constituencies here. So, what worries me is that we seem to have so little sense of history, and I'm not going down the Brandis line, um, but I do think that, you know, it's that, that groundhog phenomenon that I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. We seem to have so little memory of just what happened 15, 20 years ago when we had that Asian enmeshment push at the same point in which we were having an economic downturn and came head on to meet Pauline Hansen and One Nation. And there was a period, an ugly period of very heightened racism in Australia against colored people of indigenous and Asian um, ancestry. We seem to have very little memory of the lessons learned, and perhaps we didn't learn it very well then, of how to communicate with various constituencies to um, um, promote, to explain, and to listen empathetically to anxieties. We're in a comfortable economic position now perhaps, but if this two-track economy was to proceed and things start slowing down and we're seeing signs of it down the eastern um, um, shores already, then my question is, put that up against this increasing rhetoric of the Asian century, what roles then do we in humanities, arts and social sciences have to play in remembering perhaps some of those experiences and I hope invoking some of the lessons that we may have learned, maybe we need to be reminded of it in order to navigate these very tricky um, situations that I think will emerge. I just want to finish off by just um, a, a, a quote that I very much like by an Australian, um, an Asian Australian, now American um, academic, Peng Chia, who reminds us that the globe, he says, is not the world. Globe thinking focuses on geoeconomic relationships, you know, whether we're in the sweet spot or whether we're in the Chinese camp or the US camp. The globe is the totality produced by processes of globalization, a bounded object or entity in Mercatorian space. When we say map of the world, we really mean map of the globe. It is assumed that the spatial diffusion and extensiveness achieved through global media and markets give rise to a sense of belonging to a shared world, what Walid Ali was referring to, when one might argue that such developments lead instead to greater polarization and division of nation and regions. By contrast, Peng Chia says, the, the, world is a, the, the world and worldling is about relationships of being with, about how humans relate to each other and their environments in time and space. And I think those are the very, th that's the bottom line for what has is able to offer, is that we, as, as, as a community of academics, working and artists and practitioner, practitioners, do can offer particular insights into understanding how humans come together, how uh, uh, to get a different perspective on a disenfranchised view of the world. We have, it offers um, windows of understanding anxieties, fears, as well as uh, of identifying opportunities. And those are the very qualities that we need to harness now. If we were to face the Asian century in a clever way rather than an opportunistic way.
Thank you, Jacqueline. Peter. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about the future security environment and try and include some observations on the impact of Australia as we join the Asian century. I'm going to really, though, talk about the changing nature of security. Security in the 21st century is no longer really about territorial integrity or sovereignty. It's changed in the face of new threats and challenges, but is also, as we heard this morning, because of the nature of globalisation and the fact that we live in a world or global community. And security therefore becomes how we feel about how we live in our community as well as our sense of human security. It's a discussion really about the difference between national security and state security, about global identity and how we deal with challenges such as food, water and energy shortages and climate change. So it's a discussion about the community we live in, its values, its hopes and aspirations, our outlooks and interests, and essentially how we choose to live. Let me talk about four possible security futures, and uh, Jackie's mentioned a couple of these already. First one, US primacy. The second one, an Asian balance of power where there's competitive equilibrium. A third, an Asian concert of powers where we shared uh, the space to prevent homogeneity. And that's really the line that Hugh White is pushing. And then the final one, Chinese primacy. And as my interests lie in the security field, let me deal with three observations. Australia's security and prosperity is tied to that of Asia. Southeast Asia will be of critical importance to Australia's strategic and security interests and comprehensive engagement with the countries of the region is an essential element of our geostrategic relationships. It will not proceed smoothly. And the relationship with Indonesia is of critical importance and has to be handled sensitively and comprehensively. The second major observation, Australia will remain dependent on its alliance with the United States and will continue to encourage the active engagement of the United States in the region. In the longer term, Australian and United States interests may not always coincide. And I would wish that Australia will learn to say no. Australia has gained significant benefits from trade with China and will be faced with difficult policy choices should our interests not coincide with those of the United States. And I think right now we can look at two potential circumstances where they wouldn't coincide. And that's as issues over Taiwan and the South China Sea and the seas further to the north. In 2008, the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd read into the Parliament a national security statement. And he made the assessment that the distinctions between foreign and domestic, national and international, internal and external, had become blurred. And he was right. And that's what Wahid Ali was talking about this morning. That presents us with a really complex problem. And that's the challenge that we have to cope with in the future. And not only that challenge of the future, but it's the challenge of getting there as we look at recent events such as the global financial crisis, round two, US presidential politics, and indeed our own politics next year, fundamentalism in Pakistan, terrorism that doesn't seem to want to go away, and the rise of China. I think we can make the judgment that the status quo has gone and the complex nature of the changes that are occurring will need much more flexibility and creativity in the development of strategic policy on Australia's behalf. What we can be sure of is that the next quarter of a century will be marked by a fluidity of fortunes, uncertainty in diplomatic and strategic dealings, and an absence of a settled pattern of power relationships among the major powers. 
Many people are not sure of the inevitability of China's rise, describing them as a fragile state. They have problems with their economy, their society, their politics, and we're hearing more about their demographic problems. And all of these things may limit their rise. And we also must cope this year with a new leadership about to assume power, a leadership that we know very little about. Peter Harcher, writing in the Sydney Morning Herald in 2009, talked about China's economic power, and they are a strong economic power. But Peter spoke about mutually assured financial destruction when he talked about the relationship between China and the United States. So the question is, can they exercise their economic power? But certainly China is a growing military power, but with limited power projection capabilities and, in my assessment, a weak diplomatic power. But right now it's obvious that China is positioning itself to dispute the current regional security order. And if not managed carefully, this could have dramatic security consequences. New rivalries and tensions are emerging and old ones are resurfacing. As well as being difficult to understand, these changes will be increasingly difficult to control or influence. And this is especially the case for smaller states such as Australia. Australia must prepare for a wide range of likely futures with the potential for strategic, strategic discontinuity and shock. That was what the 2009 Australian Defence Force White Paper was. It recommended significant changes to our air and naval forces as a means of hedging against the rise of China. Well, that White Paper is now dead and buried, sacrificed on the altar of a budget surplus. But now what we see is the US pivot to the Asia-Pacific, a forced posture review in both the United States and Australia, and now a new defence white paper for mid-2013. Another example of strategic shock is what do we do if our interests do not coincide with those of the United States? And as I've suggested, this could be over a Chinese effort to retake Taiwan or more strident activity in the South China Sea. As other speakers have suggested, this puts Australia in a position where we might be faced with a choice between our major trading partner and our major security guarantor. And that's a position we don't want to be. Similarly, what do we do with the rapidly increasing efforts by many Southeast Asian states over territorial and resource disputes in the South China Sea give rise to more and more nationalistic sentiment and turn into open conflict. And it's interesting just in the last month or so to see the number of nations involved. Russia, China, Philippines, Vietnam, Japan and South Korea. Well, what does it mean to Australia? As a self-proclaimed middle power, and I'm not sure what that actually means, but we do have extensive efforts, uh, interests we need to establish and maintain an independent and integrated approach to national security based on a clear appreciation of our long-term national interests. However, as this aspiring middle power, with limited capabilities and a presence in a very dynamic part of the world, these aspirations must be matched by a cold realisation that we just can't do it all on our own. We need to use clever diplomacy, be part of global and regional multilateral arrangements and agreements, and as we've done throughout our history, seek an alliance with a like-minded, great and powerful friend. The issue is how to maintain a relationship with a close and powerful friend, and that's code for the United States, that is at the same time allows us an independent approach to the issues that really concern us here. It's clear that a special relationship with the US requires some skin in the game. And the cost of the alliance is a commitment to support the alliance partner with economic, diplomatic and military power. 
in the final measure, it means troops on the ground. In the last decade, that's meant Iraq and Afghanistan. Perhaps for the next decade, it means ships and planes at sea or in the air. I'll leave you with the question, is this the price we are obliged to pay in a new era of strategic dynamism in the Asian century? Thank you, Peter, for that very uh, um, wise and authoritative analysis. Monica. Thanks, John. Um, there's so much of what has been said this morning that I uh, am finding myself in um, total agreement with. Um, but I'm here to replace Joe Hildebrand, so I'm going to come at things that are from a different perspective, rather uh, a more on-the-ground perspective, I, although I promise I won't be dumb, drunk and racist in any way, shape or form. Um, and nor would Joe have been, but uh, that was the program that he did for the ABC. Now, it strikes me as uh, extraordinary that for such a diverse and multicultural nation such as Australia, that it's still so white bread in so many ways, that we still struggle with finding um, things which transcend a national identity that seems to have been constructed for us for any number of political and historical reasons and that we have still failed beyond a policy level to see the benefits of Asia literacy, generally speaking. I'm the daughter of 1940s European um, migrants. Uh, there was a lot of racism when I was growing up in Australia in the 1960s and 1970s. It was a pretty miserable place to be if you, were, if you looked like me. Um, as I grew older, Australia did indeed change. Much has been said about the, its metamorphosis into a thriving multicultural society. I don't think we need to go, to, to go over much ground there. It became uh, a great place to live, um, a, a thriving multicultural land full of ghettos of people from different corners of the world who, you know, who live and multiply and import their customs and their foods and their takes on the world. Um, as a result, by the time I got to my 30s, I thought that Australia had... Um, was it was really the lucky country and had achieved the lofty status of a fabulous melting pot. That is, of course, until Pauline Hanson came along and disabused me of that notion. And after 30 years of feeling quite Australian, whatever that meant, I began to question what, what the hell that was. Um, since then, I think, again, we've come a long way. I'm not sure that a melting pot, however, is going to stand us in particularly good stead, and I find myself in total agreement with Jacqueline on this point of what it means to view the globe uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a broad sense. Um, I certainly don't think that uh, Australia being a melting pot has helped us to um, come to grips with Asia in any way, shape or form. We tend to see Asia as a place, one place, one people, one culture, one economy when it suits us, one tourist destination, although of course we know the difference between Phuket and Langkawi as a holiday destination. Uh, we delineate parts of, of Asia for, uh, which appear economically stronger and more viable for our particular long-term uh, benefits, countries such as China, but we don't understand the intra-Asian cultural, political, social and economic differences and dynamics. As a journalist, it strikes me as extraordinary that there are not many reporters out there um, other than very, very long-term Asia hands, many of whom are taking redundancy thanks to uh, uh, constrictions in the media business, um, who are able to convey the subtleties uh, of difference between Asian nations. Um, as, say, we understand the subtleties of the differences between France and Germany or the Netherlands and Spain. We get those differences. Do we get the differences between various Asian nations? Um, ask a lot of Australians whether that's important uh, when we ask people to come here and be one people and they say, no, not very. And I find that really frustrating. Um, I think what Australia hasn't learnt from the great European migration story of the 50s and 60s is that people might leave their homelands, but they retain their cultural and their social norms. And no community which excludes this inevitability can hope to be successful, not in the short or in the long term. Forcing people to be one, I think, just creates tension. Uh, and those tensions can multiply with time and generations. That can lead to alienation, to resentments, at being misunderstood, pushed back by those who think they're being rejected, as we saw so vividly in Sydney a couple of weekends ago. 
Worse still, of course, the possibility that, is, that a failure to understand individual nations and nations as individual might lead to stereotyping, which is both dangerous and humiliating and hurtful, and very, very, very easy for white bread Australia to latch onto. For example, are all Indonesians the most popular of Muslim nations fundamentalists? How many times do we hear that out there in non-academic land? A lot. Uh, are all Chinese business oriented people intent on buying our farms and our agribusinesses? I hear that a lot. Are all Indians who come to Australia determined to better themselves at the expense of my child? I hear that a lot. Um, it strikes me that we've not achieved what Paul Keating envisioned when he spoke for the very first time, shocked us all by saying that Australia should see itself as part of Asia. He advocated a subtle understanding of difference, but 25 years on, even our education system uh, is, as we've heard, struggling to come to grips with difference. Ministers might agree on goals for Asia literacy, but uh, we, the education system either continues to put up French as a language of primary importance for high school students, and when it speaks of the importance of recognising our place in the Asia century, it doesn't speak of communicating in what Walid Ali calls this hyper-complex world. I think all of that sends a message to educationists and to students and parents alike that there is one amorphous Asia. It strikes me too that parents still often determine, for example, which school their child will go to based on the proportion of Australians to Asians. I still hear that on the streets. That's a result of a lifetime of seeing Asians as the other. Uh, we hear time and time again that our present and future prosperity is tied to Asia, but we continue to ex assume that proximity to Asia that our natural resources and our openness is enough for us to make good in what we hear is the Asian century. We see that if we continue to sell our resources to China, we have proven that we are somehow indispensable to and of necessity a part of Asia. We don't understand that that's actually not enough. I think the challenge is not limited to policymakers and politicians. I think it's also one for communities to find a more nuanced and a more consistent long-term way of seeing ourselves as part of and not different to Asia. To do this, we need to do many things, but amongst them, we need to ditch industry policies which were rooted in the 50s. We need to put into place cultural and educational policies which have left Australians looking at themselves in the mirror and not seeing ourselves the way other people see us. Uh, I'd love to see organisations like COAG uh, put on its slate of reforms a national strategy, which they have, uh, we, as we've heard, but put money behind a national strategy to uh, improve Asian, Asia literacy in schools. I think we need to be, as the Foreign Minister, Senator Bob Carr, said in New York just yesterday, um, thinking beyond the mining boom and catering to the rising Asian middle class, and to do this, we need to know Asia. Uh, I think we need, to, I'd love to see a free-to-air television network, for example, which is devoted to programming um, from the various nations of Asia so that we can better understand each other. Obviously, money is, at the, is the crux of the problem, but to continue to live with the delusion that merely digging up our resources and shipping them off to China will somehow miraculously morph us into the Asian equation strikes me as short-sighted at best and xenophobic at worst. And uh, sadly, over the last two decades, that seemed, those two sentiments have, have dominated our thinking on Asia. Thank you, Moni Monica. Um, very stimulating, provocative as always. Thank you very much. Um, before we just go, can I just check whether Officer Jules, how do you want me to, five minutes? Okay. We're very keen to uh, open up to the floor uh, before we go into our next session. So um, if anyone has any, Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, uh, just I won't go into the, into, into the deep specifics of it because they're for probably uh, somebody um, who's... Uh, who's more knowledgeable about the specifics of them. But, for example, I mean, I think that the policies which determine um, who can invest in Australia, um, although they're constantly revised and the numbers are constantly going upwards, uh, still tend to um, 
discriminate, as we've seen recently, um, <coughs> against Chinese investors, for example. Um, we're very, very happy to allow Americans and New Zealanders to come in here and invest to, at, at a very, very high uh, level um, and in some industries without any scrutiny whatsoever. But the alarm bells go off when it's Asians or Chinese in particular. Um, so uh, there are also, and I think that there are also, there, the taxation regime in relation to investment also could probably, you know, do with a, a revisiting of sorts. Um, but the foreign investment one, I think, is the one that I find basically shockingly xenophobic. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Who would you, who would like to try that one? Krishna wants to take it. Okay, Krishna? I don't have an um, answer to your question, um, but I did want to point out the implicit assumptions behind your question. And so you might want to rethink the question rather than seeking an answer. Um, to say Chinese have a different way of thinking about business um, than Australians is to assume that all Australians think in one way and all Chinese think in another way. We're, we know that the Chinese ethnic group is diverse just as Australians are diverse. What you probably want to think about, what you probably want to ask is about state ownership in China. And that's probably the question that you were seeking to ask as to whether private business and state-owned business are fundamentally of different nature. So, I'm not answering the question, I'm just rephrasing it. <laughs> okay, thanks Krishna. We've got probably time for one more. Yes. Can I just make a quick comment, uh, uh, John, and it's uh, taking on board the points that you're making. One of the things um, that we have not valued in the Australian schooling system is learning a second language. So I gave you some statistics about Asian languages, but in fact there's only 13% of all year 12 students who study a second language at all. 13% of Australian year 12 students studying a second language. We've also made languages largely optional at high school um, after year eight. So children actually get a choice um, about five or six times through their schooling if they're going to continue on with languages. And imagine if we did that for maths. <laughs> and a lot of people have said, what we've got to work at is got to build student demand for languages. And I know it's not a direct correlation, but we don't think we have to build student demand for maths. 
I reckon we'd have just... Well, it is compulsory, okay? So I think we'd have just as many students who'd drop out if they could. The point that I'm using this to make is that we haven't got a high value on the skill of second language learning in our schools. And that's really set us apart. And if I could just make a final point, when Tony Abbott in his post-budget speech said a coalition government will have 40% of Year 12 students studying an Asian language. And um, a lot of the media response uh, that I was directly involved with the next day said to me, isn't that just a ridiculous aspiration? How could that ever work? And it was extremely challenging considering the current figures 13%. But my response to that is that in education systems, in most other parts of the world, children are exiting schooling with second language proficiency. 100%, not 40%. Can I also add there just another on-the-street observation? Could you um, make it uh, quick, Monica? As a, yeah, very quickly, as a, as a, as a parent, that um, it, it strikes me as extraordinary that in primary schools, when they offer uh, other languages, they offer, you know, for example, where my son went to school, German. Why German? Because it aids in the learning of English. When he got to high school, Latin. Why? Because it aids in the learning of English. Um, but uh, be, as you say, beyond year eight, language is not compulsory. Um, and there are no Asian languages offered. There were no Asian languages on offer whatsoever. So it was either continue with German or continue with Latin. Thank you. Um, I mean, I have to say, I'm using my privilege as chair, that uh, when I came to Australia three years ago, one of the first things I attended was a, a, a session which uh, was bemoaning the lack of uh, language uh, acquisition and uh, learning in Australia and the fact that Australia was a monoglot country. Now, in the part of Sydney that I lived in at that time, it seemed to me that pretty much everyone that I lived near spoke at least two languages, many of them spoke three. So I concluded that the problem for Australia is that educated Australians are monoglot, uneducated Australians uh, speak loads of languages. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we have a real challenge in capturing that potential. And I, I know it's a sort of glib remark, but it's actually, as glib remarks often are, true. Um, <laughs> and how we capture that uh, linguistic potential and also not, um, I, I mean, I think it's a basic human right to speak, to, sp to speak the language that you choose to speak, frankly. And, and I think we've got to get over linguistic ex exclusivity as well. I'd like to, though, to finish by thanking my colleagues on this panel, uh, particularly for really working hard to, to keep us to time. Uh, we've almost got to where we intended to be. And uh, thank you to you for listening and for the questioners. Thank you.